thank you, Matt. We, we have Matt Palmer online, uh, continuing, continuing in some way the uh, previous uh, presentation by Karina, and uh, talking about, are you, are you ready to talk now, Matt? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Just okay. let me get the presentation up. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's a presentation on ocean heat content and the Earth uh, energy balance, insight from climate models. Thank you, Matt. Okay. Right. Um, can you see my screen okay? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, so, um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the invitation to speak at the, at the meeting. I'm sorry I can't be with you. Um, it looks like a great meeting. Um, so, I'm going to talk a bit about um, ocean heat content and Earth's energy imbalance from uh, some work we've been doing with climate models. So this is some work um, that I've done with colleagues, um, uh, Chris Roberts, Doug McNeil at the Met Office, and also Freya Gary, uh, Roberto Fernandez, Bill Bow at the University of Reading, and Jonathan Gregory. Um, so the outline of the talk, I'm going to give a bit of context and talk a little bit about the global warming hiatus, which I'm sure is something that we're all pretty familiar with now. There's uh, been a lot of papers written about this subject. Um, I'm then going to talk, uh, there's sort of two main parts of the talk after that, so the first is looking at um, pre-industrial control simulations from CMIT-5 models and what they can tell us about um, variations of Earth's energy budget. Um, and the second part is um, really about forced uh, simulations, so this is mostly um, Freya Gary's work but also some of the other literature that's out there. Uh, so I'll be looking at historical RCP 8.5 simulations. And then at the end, I'll, I'll, I'll summarise the findings and I'll, I'll sort of outline what I think are some of the open questions in this area. Okay, so the global warming hiatus um, is this uh, stalling of the surface temperature rise. So if we look, hopefully you can see my pointer here. Um, in this latter part of the record, which I'm sure you'll all be familiar with, um, the surface temperature hasn't been rising. Um, as quickly as we, we would expect based on climate model simulations. Um, and if we look at a background warming rate to give us some idea of what the rate is, um, you know, since about the 1970s, we've seen a warming rate that's about 0.2 Kelvin per decade. So that's what we might call a background warming rate. And that's a useful number to have in mind when we, when we look at some of these model simulations later. Uh, so in terms of the hiatus itself, um, there's basically two, two ways that we can bring about a sort of slowdown in Earth's surface temperature rise. So the first is a, a, a change in the net radiation at the top of the atmosphere. So this is a change in the rate of energy convergence within that system. And um, some of the recent published um, estimates put that about 0.6 watts per meter squared. And the other potential sort of causal factor for a hiatus on these sorts of time scales is a rearrangement of ocean heat content. So just rearranging the energy of the system. Okay, so moving on to the first part of the talk, the first results section. So this is all about um, pre-industrial control uh, simulations based on CMIT-5 models. So the approach that we're going to use is to assume a linear combination of forcings and internal variability within the real world. So we can analyze multi-century CMIT-5 pre-industrial control uh, simulations to address these questions. Okay, so the first thing we're going to ask is on what time scale does net TOA come into balance with changes in total ocean heat content? Uh, the second question is what is the potential role of internal variability in uh, net top of atmosphere radiation uh, for the recent pause in surface warming? And then the third question is what's the potential of ocean heat redistribution for the recent pause in surface warming? Okay, so all. I just note that all the analyses that we present here are um, highly idealized studies, so we're not taking account of um, realistic observational sampling in this work. We're just trying to get um, a first order look at the potential for rearrangement of heat and, and the variation in net, net top atmosphere radiation. Okay, so this is one of the key plots that was published in a a paper that came out last year in um, environmental research letters. So this is looking at 10-year trends in uh, surface temperature against the trend in total system 
energy. So the way this is plotted is the 10-year trend in um, Earth system energy is on the y-axis in watts per meter squared. And then the 10-year trend in global average surface temperature in Kelvin per decade is on the x-axis. And what we can see is that while there's a, a, a positive correlation, um, in, in general, um, the trend in global surface temperature is a fairly weak, um, weak end indicator of what's happening at the top of the atmosphere. Um, so you can see that in these quadrants that I'm pointing out here, that they're actually of opposite sign. And I think on average that um, the number of decades that are of opposite sign is about one third of the distribution based on all CMIP5 models. Okay, so conversely, if we look at full depth ocean heat content, we find this very robust relationship between um, the uh, trends in 10-year Earth system energy and the 10-year trend in Earth global ocean heat content. And this, of course, is because the, 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 the global ocean is um, the Earth system's primary heat store, and it's dominant um, on these timescales. So if we were, or if we are able to monitor global ocean heat content well, then we have a very robust um, indicator in, in terms of keeping track of Earth's energy imbalance. Um, okay, so you could, having got this result, you can ask the question, well, on what time scale does the ocean become the dominant term in the energy budget? And we attempted to quantify that here, so we're looking at um, the um, correlation between the um, trend in the Earth system energy content and the trend in total ocean heat content as a function of trend length in months this time. So we've got a whole bunch of CMIP5 models are plotted up here. And what you can see is for the vast majority of these models, the uh, correlation starts to saturate out at about 12 months or so. So it looks like, based on these CMIP5 models, the ocean becomes the dominant term in their energy budget on a time scale of about 12 months. And this is relevant to some of the um, other papers that have been published in this area, such as uh, the Lobetel study that was published a few years ago in um, Nature Geoscience, Science, where they're trying to uh, confront the series top of atmosphere satellite measurements, which, which track the changes at, in net TOA and comparing that to changes in ocean heat content for consistency. Okay, <clears throat> so the other thing that you can look at, um, and this time it's, it's on a decadal time scale again, is the depth of the ocean you, that you need to sample in order to get the best um, estimate of the net TOA. So we have, um, we have four panels here, but they're all showing the same thing. It's just um, different models in, in each panel with the, the total range of the model behaviors is um, indicated by the shaded regions. So without getting into too much detail, basically what we're trying to show here is how the um, uncertainty in, in your estimate of, of the radiative imbalance decreases as a function of depth. So as you might expect, as you integrate over more of the vertical column, you're able to retrieve a better estimate of what the net top of atmosphere radiation is. So I guess the key thing to say about this is that the models vary quite a lot in, in their behavior, and particularly the, um, the information content with depth changes quite a lot. You know, it's quite variable among models. So you, you might have to um, integrate deeper in some models than others to get a reliable estimate of net TOA. Okay, so um, thinking back again to the hiatus specifically, um, one of the things we wanted to do um, was to look at the uh, the magnitude of trends in a, a, a bunch of different variables um, as a function of trend length. So um, what we have on the y-axis is the magnitude of the trends. So we're, we're trying to plot uh, both sides of the distribution. So we have uh, both positive and negative values. Uh, and then what we do is we um, extend the trend length in years along the x-axis. And you can see this uh, reduction in the magnitude of the trend as a function of trend length, which is sort of what we'd expect from, from internal variability. So when we look at surface temperature, which is a, you know, a very familiar variable, what we find is that time scales of about 10 years, it's very easy to accommodate um, 
a, a trend of, of a few tenths of a Kelvin uh, per decade. So it's, you know, as previous authors have found, it's, it's fairly straightforward to um, eradicate the 0 0.2 Kelvin per decade um, trend, sort of background warming trend, just through, um, just, just by invoking um, internal variability alone. I should say that, that these dotted lines are the maximum trend that we find f for any model. So it's just to give the absolute um, upper bound on, on what we would find from any SEMA 5 model within the archive. So this is the surface temperature in some ways is a result we've seen before. But what was very interesting and definitely I found very surprising when, when we did this work was um, the magnitude of the total energy um, trends that can arise just just through internal variability alone. So when we think about the hiatus and some of the literature, um, some of the um, external forcing mechanisms which have been talked about are generally um, in the order of about 0.1 maybe to 0.2 uh, watts per meter squared. And we can find that on a 10 year time scale that actually you have a similar magnitude um, of changes in net TOA can arise from internal variability alone. So it would be very interesting to to understand further um, how this comes about. Okay, so I'll move on to the next slide now. Um, so this is all about um, the ability of ocean heat content to, uh, or the ability of the ocean to rearrange heat basically. And this again is expressed in watts per meter squared relative to Earth's surface area. So if we look at the fluxes across the 100 meter um, isobath then, we have a, at um, decadal timescales, we have a sort of a, an order of magnitude changes that can be supported of about 0.1 to 0.2 watts per meter squared. So these are a fairly big chunk of the 0 0.6 watts per meter squared that we, that we understand as being the approximate magnitude of Earth's energy imbalance uh, sort of right now. Um, so as we move to deeper levels, again, as we might expect, our capacity to rearrange heat is somewhat reduced, so we have, you know, we have a lesser, um, we have, we find lesser fluxes across this, um, across 1800 meters, and this is chosen, of course, to be uh, roughly commensurate with the, with the depth of the Argo uh, profiling floats. <clears throat> okay, so I'm just, the next few slides are really to just give you a qualitative feel for how the the character and magnitude of ocean heat rearrangement varies um, among the CMIT-5 models. So this is these are just um, Hofmuller plots over 200 years. We have depth on the on the x-axis, uh, sorry, the y-axis, <laughs> and we have time of, of 200 years on the on the x-axis. So you can see, um, I mean, if I just flick through some of these, so these are all the different models. You'll see different uh, patterns, and you'll see different um, depths over where the the variability seems to be active, and you'll see different time scales of the um, vertical propagation of features. Uh, so I, I think really all I'm trying to say here is that um, the choice of CMIT-5 model really matters for the, for the ocean variability, and, and there's a lot of diversity out there. Okay, so to summarize quickly the, um, the pre-industrial control simulations, the ocean becomes a dominant term in the energy budget on a time scale of about one year. Uh, the changes in net TOA associated with internal variability are of order 0.1 to 0.3 watts per meter square, squared on decadal time scale. So this is large compared to what we think the current um, imbalance is. And the ocean heat rearrangement across the various isobaths I've discussed is substantial, but it, it doesn't seem to be as important in these model simulations as changes in the net TOA itself. And it's a slightly smaller magnitude. Um, so. Uh, compared to previous studies, um, you know, 10 to 15 year hiatus could, uh, could be explained by internal variability alone and, and there's, we published a paper in uh, Nature Climate Change this year, um, which I'm going to briefly show some plots from, but I think Matt Collins is going to talk about this in a lot more depth tomorrow. Um, and that surface temperature trends are not a reliable indicator of changes in, in Earth system energy and hence global warming on decadal timescales. I've said something about the representation of the internal variability varies considerably among the CMIT-5 models, which is obviously something we should seek to understand better. 
Okay, I'm, I'm really going to skim through this uh, in the interest of time and because I think Matt's going to talk a lot in a lot more detail about this. But basically, CMIC 5 will show different flavors of, of hiatus event, but they all agree that the Pacific is a key region. Uh, we, we know that following a hiatus decade, there's a greater change of accelerated warming to do with the reversal of the trends that we see in the Pacific. Um, and that here's a couple of fingerprints showing a composite of a, which is dominated by, uh, you know, um, a PDO-like pattern. And to first order, the um, the accelerated warming decade really looks just like a reversal of the um, cooling PDO-like pattern that we see for the high indices. Um And then I guess something that we've probably been, I guess many of us have probably been thinking about a little bit, is wondering about whether there's a role for um, for external forcings during the hiatus. So um, this is a, uh, a slide from Roberto Bilbao and um, he's showing here the um, observed rate of sea level change based on the satellite altimeter relative to the global mean and the hatched reason, regions are regions where the models, uh, so the trends are inconsistent with, with unforced variability in at least two-thirds of the CMIC-5 models. So clearly this might be indicative of a role for external forcings but equally it may be indicative of uh, it, might, it may be indicative that the, in, that the internal variability that's represented in the CMIC-5 models is too small. Okay, so I think I've been speaking for about, <laughs> for about 15 minutes, so I'll try and go through the next few slides fairly quickly. So this is about looking to the future, really, um, and, and also the, the sort of um, uh, historical past. So this is a slide from Freya Gary. So this work's been submitted to Environmental Research Letters a, a, a few weeks ago, I think. And really, we're, we're looking here a bit at spatial patterns. So this is based on the pre-industrial control runs. And really, um, we're looking at the, um, from, from left to right, we're looking at di different depth layers. So the upper 700 meters, then 700 to 2,000 meters, then 2,000 to, 2, to 4,000 meters. And it's just an idea of the magnitude of the variability and where that's happening. Um, so you can see that as you start to get deeper, or particularly in this layer, uh, we see a lot of variability in the Atlantic. And um, I guess for this deep, deepest layer, there's a lot of, uh, while all the models show that the Atlantic's a key sector, the GIS, the GIS model, GIS, GIS E2R, there's a typo there, but. Um, you know, shows that both the Pacific and the Atlantic could be important. Um, so this is looking at the variability. I should say that the, the, the premise of this work is about monitoring the Earth's in, um, energy imbalance through uh, ocean heat content changes. So the other thing that's important, as well as the variability, is the emergent signal that we're trying to trace. So again, um, as from uh, left to right, we're going increasingly down through the water column. And again, the, the Atlantic is emerging as a, a place where there's a lot of action as well as the Southern Ocean. Um, and this is some work from uh, Celine Huse, who's published some nice papers looking at the uh, CMIP-5 bottom water properties under RCP 8.5. Um, so for our purposes, particularly the bottom temperature that we're interested in, we see this, um, what a, what is apparently a strong southern uh, signal which seems to be spreading northward. So this is reminiscent of some of the um, observational work by Perky and Johnson, for example. So there's some interesting parallels there. Okay, I'm going to, I'm, so I'm going to skip through the next slide. This is just showing how the temperature varies as a function of model. And, uh, and uh, there are some differences, but there's also some fairly common features particularly the northward spread from the southern, from the southern ocean region. Um, so this is um, going back to Freya Gary's work again. So what this is doing, uh, these different colours are trying to show um, the bias in watts per metre squared that, that we have in trying to um, estimate what the true Earth's energy imbalance is based on um, the uh, changes in ocean heat content observed to successively increasing depths. And what we basically find, so if we concentrate on this upper left-hand panel for now, is that while 
um, measuring only the upper 700 metres may have been adequate for uh, monitoring the change in Earth's energy imbalance up to 2000 or so. And as we move into the 21st century, then we start to get, um, it basically starts to become um, inadequate um, in that we get a large bias between um, between our estimate of the Earth's energy imbalance and what we're able to monitor with ocean heat content change because the, the um, climate change signal is starting to spread um, into the deeper ocean and therefore we need to monitor more of the deeper ocean in order to keep track of it. And um, it's particularly the Southern Ocean and the Atlantic and Southern Oceans where, we, where, where that signal emerges. So we can, um, we can gain quite a lot of the benefit of a deep um, Argo array by concentrating uh, deep float deployments within those basins, you know, to start with, to keep track of this energy imbalance. Um, so the Atlantic and the Southern Ocean are key regions for ocean heat content variability and the response to anthropogenic warming. And um, the climate change signal does start to extend over the full depth of the water column. And Argo-like observations are adequate to monitor the Earth's energy imbalance um, historically, but we, but we really do need deeper observations in, in, in order to do this over the 21st century. And um, as I think we've seen uh, previously, that the patterns of magnitudes of ocean heat content variability and change vary by single five model. Um, so very quickly, um, these are some open questions. Um, how might realistic sampling of the ocean affect the results presented here? It's an important question from the monitoring point of view. Um, what is the relative importance of the deep ocean, the ice-covered regions, and the marginal seas that, might, that might, be, uh, might touch on some of the uh, work that uh, Karina has presented? And, um, you know, are there important missing processes such as our, um, Antarctic bottom water formation? I think we're on the cusp where we're starting to look at um, a couple of models where we have um, eddy permitting uh, models and it's interesting to think about how that might affect these results and whether there are other modes of variability which come into play. There's some uh, literature that, you know, that's starting to come out about that. And um, ultimately, how do we determine which models are most likely Reality, and I think you know that ultimately we need to aim for process-based constraints on the climate model projections because uh, we want you know that's something we should be working towards. So I'll leave it there and take any questions. And thanks for your thanks for your attention.